pay or blue dot. All right, we're here today with uh, Tom O'Han. He's one of my mates from, uh, I've met him a little while ago now. Yeah. Probably through uh, his girlfriend, but also one of our more um, mutual friends, Carl Porter. And that was that first day that we first met each other up in <laughs> Sydney when you uh, came up to interview him and you started serenading him that was one of the, the highlights of the, one of the things i first remember of you so that was pretty funny yeah god that was yeah that was good um oh, that's right we were talking about i think i was serenading single ladies to him yes that yeah. was very good it was like the Khan porter single ladies rendition yeah like if you do if you are uh, ever looking for that it's like on adventure fit travel podcast, yeah it's it? called brolosophy now Bro-losophy. it's my mate's podcast bill but it's it's in the archi- archives there it's a uh, the time I'll ever forget, my friend. <laughs> I was basically coming on to him. <laughs> well, he's, a, he's an attractive human. He's a good looking if man. If he's listening to this, then hopefully he gets a bit of a, um, a G up from it. Yes, very true. Um, <laughs> what have you been up to? Mate. Um, since then. Yeah, since then, been... Um, well, I always loved podcasting when Bill and I were doing it together. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I think at that time I was getting more and more interested in the mind um, trying to come to terms with kind of my own mind, understand myself a bit more and, um, just kind of studying psychology, you know, and doing all that sort of thing led to the Mind Mate podcast, um, which is my own show. And then that just kind of really took off into just again, like enveloping this idea that, you know, the study of the mind and talking about the mind, anything to do with the mind is, is really, um, at least at this stage of my life, um, you know, what my ego has attached itself to. And it gives me a lot of purpose, um, gives me a lot of meaning, um, allows me to get out of bed every day. And um, just recently, I've started my own counseling practice. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, which is really, really exciting. <laughs> and um, just kind of, you know, I think from just from the short time I've been doing it, speaking to people about their lives, I've just noticed that so many mental health issues can be avoided with practical changes in our lives. Like yeah. just little things that we can do to just serve ourselves a little more. I'm not talking about tools necessarily, but like even just little things like, you know what? Every day I go to work and I just feel this massive sack on my head. Yeah. Taking a bit of time to recognize why that would be the case as opposed to shaming the feeling, oh fuck, I've got depression or whatever it is. It's like, yeah, well, hang on yeah. a second. Like that's a signal. It's trying to tell you something. Just give it 15 minutes and very quickly, for example, you're probably going to realize, well, it's probably because your boss verbally abuses you every day. And then from that, you can take the stoic approach and you can be like, okay, I've got two things I can do here. I can tell him to stop and actually try to work towards some sort of conflict resolve or I can leave. And just a practical change like that, you know, helps us out so much when you're dealing with um, complex trauma and addiction and, you know, developmental trauma. You know, they, they can be really difficult to kind of change those behavioral patterns that have, you know, you know, yeah, it's like, changing those patterns and just checking in with that story and mm. seeing whether, okay, like, all right, I, I see this story happening. Mm. How, how can I change you to like rectify that pattern? And, yeah. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. And, um, I mean that that's becoming like a, a bigger interest of mine is, is looking into complex trauma, um, PTSD, um, you know, and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, like like what I said at the beginning of that whole fucking tangent was basically just how we can find more meaning and stuff. And that's you and know, that's studying what you're the mind. Doing at the, your cl- is it a, your clinic or your yeah? Clinic? It's 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 uh it's actually a meditation studio that my other half is opening up. So oh, she's lovely. opening up the the breathwork shed. So the way we kind of wanted to market it was you know, somatic experiencing is one of the best ways to release trauma because you're actually. And there's a number of physiological things that are going on inside of the brain, but fundamentally you're releasing these implicit memories or at least bringing them into conscious awareness. And when that occurs, the ego starts to re-narrativize what that was. And what I would like to do in those situations is when people through the, this sort of breathwork meditation are made aware of, like you said, behavioral patterns or things that happened to them when they were very young or things that they've just started to realize have actually led their life for them um, or influence them negatively or whatever it is, I could come in with my counseling experience and help them um, kind of understand that a little bit more. Yeah. So that's what's really exciting. That's really cool. Mm. So you guys have literally now joined forces. Like 
Sh- like Siobhan, yeah. Siobhan, his partner is pretty amazing. And so what you guys are doing there is like hitting it two different ways and essentially being able to help the, the community in a mm. well-rounded, holistic kind of approach, I guess. Yeah. So it's pretty good to see like your ev- both of your evolutions from like being in the CrossFit gym and like <laughs> pretty much like, like being that person with the, the sack over the head and just dragging your ass in there sometimes just because like you had to do it but now you guys are like frothing on the things that you're doing it's yeah pretty good to see so the mind mate like is that still going or is like the the podcast and stuff like that or is it definitely yeah um, yeah and but you're kind of taking it more down that the counseling route and stuff like that yeah i think so i mean i love that podcast you know that that podcast you know you were on the show mate yeah. it was fucking brilliant you know if you're listening to your story that i had i had no idea about and um you know, we live in a world where everything's so busy now. You know, everyone is, has stuff on. But the best thing about podcasting, it allows two people to make time for each other and, and bring that together. And sometimes it even is with mates, you know, yeah. like you and I. Like, we're good, really good friends. But um, we both lead busy lives. And that's that's something that we put on ourselves, you know, for good yeah. reasons because we're interested in a lot of things. But um, making time like this is a great way for us to connect and chat and, and do that sort of thing. So the podcast is... is hits um, three fronts really it's psychology spirituality and, and philosophy yep. but it's essentially um, about ways to get to know your mind and you know it's um, gender inclusive it's all demographics it's um, I try to get a vast variety of people on there people that have um, you know psychedelic assisted therapy um, I do some blogs of my own in there um, you know all different sorts of psychologists and, and things like that I just thought it would be really cool to bridge the gap between psychologists and potential patients and clients because there's a lot of uh you know there's a lot of untapped knowledge that i think that we can just kind of you know learn together and it was a really good way for me to kind of um learn myself so that i could be the best counselor um i could be to to my own clients yeah it's kind of like a bit of a cathartic experience in itself you kind of learning as you go but you're also learning about yourself and um you can kind of start to see these tendencies or even these interests that you're you're inv- interested in it's yeah. like there you can see some podcasters it's almost like a, a therapy session for themselves massive but like it's also if you can allow that space for the person who's on to actually allow their their, their story to come forward it's like it's great and that's where i want to go to with next is like a bit of like your background like what you've been through what's led you to this point now like you've Obviously, you've written a book and stuff like that, but what's got you to this point? Why? What's formed you, and what have you dealt with? Yeah, um, I mean, I I did not grow up wanting to be interested in the mind, really. You know, I, I wanted to be an AFL player, um, and I wanted to run on the MCG, as I think a lot of kids did. You know, um, but I guess what kind of got me into it. Unfortunately, the time was just um, a massive panic attack, a big trigger um, when I was 21. And um, I've since kind of forensically, scientifically gone back into my childhood to figure out why that did trigger me so much. And there was a specific time in my childhood, um, you know, where, you know, basically when there, there are three different responses to fear and there's fight, flight, or freeze. And we know, we all know those three. There's actually a fourth one, really, a piece, which is more of a conscious thing. It's like you befriend someone. Kind of this you know, like, hey, man, yeah, like, cool. you know, yeah. here's yeah. my wallet, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, um, which is kind of like a flight, really. But um, fight, flight, and freeze. And, um, you know, we know the first two. We're not really too sure about the third one, which is freeze. And what actually happens is when we're... When danger is present or when our evolutionary circuitry thinks that danger is present... And it, we also were aware that we can't get away from it. So we can't fight because the person's a lot bigger than us. We can't run because we're trapped. We freeze. And all of that stuff in the body that's preparing us for these incredibly you know, scary times is internalized. All that cortisol, that adrenaline is trapped. And um, you know, if it's not let out, like animals in the wild will shake vigorously after a, a fearful moment to make sure that all that tension is released. If it's not released, it can trap itself. And that's what happened to me when I was very young. It's a very uh, innocuous experience. It's a very innocent experience. It's actually something that I 
um, st- struggled to talk about for a long time because I was I shamed myself for years so so much about it. But essentially, uh, when I was ten, uh, me and a friend of mine um, I don't really, I don't actually see him anymore not for any reason but we were um, just playing with each other. You know, it was a very innocent childhood thing. We we're touching each other's private parts and touching each other's bums and shit like that. Yeah. You know, and. Um, Anyway, we were doing that upstairs. We were playing like Age of Empires and doing that thing as well. And his parents were walking up the stairs. And because we're upstairs, we were trapped. So that talks about that freeze response. And I got very scared very quickly. Um, Not for any reason that I thought what we were doing was bad. Just because I I just had this intense sensation that like of judgment. Like his parents would judge us. And, you know, this is... I'm reflecting on this experience as an adult. But back then, you know, none of this would have made sense. I was just a kid doing something kiddie. And um, anyway, that happened and, um, you know, more or less they kind of saw what we were doing and nothing really came about. They probably didn't even care. You know, it's a very classic childhood thing. But I shamed myself for it for, for so many years. And, you know, like I was telling you about when you don't shake all that tension out vigorously, it internalizes. And... Um, Anyway, something, again, relatively innocuous when I was 21 um, triggered it massively again. And that led me into this incredibly challenging path of intense obsessive compulsive disorder, which is essentially a response. And there's not a whole lot of research about it, but there's essentially a response from self-shame. And it's a trigger from some sort of subjective traumatic experience when you're younger. And it's essentially this idea that, you know, you're not deserved um, of happiness and all this sort of thing it's all very unconscious um but that led me down this four or five six year journey of trying to understand myself more and understand the mind more and i was also very obsessive compulsive with other things like you know i if i i'd had to pick up lots of rubbish to prove to god that i was a good person um otherwise i'd go to hell for eternity and all this sort of stuff but ocd was fundamentally my big issue and then understanding more about that understanding um, the way other people's minds work, you know, how we all have just this mammalian, you know, three billion year, certainly two million year um, circuitry in us that's allowed us to survive to now doing this podcast has just kind of been what has led me to be obsessed with conversations like this. Yeah, it's a great journey. Yeah. But it's like, it's funny when you start to like go on that um, path of self-realization and unpicking the little bits and pieces and those little little journeys that that you thought that that they may not have been or your parents or someone might have thought that that was like not an issue Mm. and then it just continues and it continues to to snowball until sometimes you just go oh fuck i've had enough of this i need to work out what's going on and yeah i've been through that myself Mm. with different a few different things mm. like and it's just like you go holy fuck like where is that trigger coming from yeah where is that trigger coming from and then i found like with meditation and sitting in it and sitting with it and seeing what and where it's where it's coming up and yeah you can generally just start to really work through it and you just dive a little bit deeper and go okay where was that why was that coming up where and then yeah i've had this like things where it's just it's come up where like even with my um parents splitting up mm, mm. i always Massive. used to, i'd stop i stopped like accepting help with yep. from people and it was came back from when my parents split up and one would give me money and the other one would kick up a stink or the other one would give me money or do something for me and the other one was like a, like a bitch or an asshole for doing it yeah so i was like well fuck this i'm not gonna do i'm not gonna like accept help from anyone because yep. I'll just do it all myself because yep. then that way then I'm not going to get into trouble f- or feel bad for taking like and feel guilt mm. and it's funny like when you start to dive back and you go okay like that's not me that was their stuff or whatever it's like and you and you start to have this like really strong sense of release or mm. in that area that you're feeling it in the guts in the, the chest and when you start to feel that it's just like Oh man, it's, it's a heaven. lightness. Yeah, it's such a lightness when yeah. it leaves you, and it's really like when I, I realized that situation. Then it was like I started bawling. Yeah, of course. I was bored. Like, I was like, "Holy shit, this is just a, it's a new release." Like yeah. now I can off, ask for help, like, and it's just like 
cool. Yeah. Like, it's actually empowering in the end. And it's like once it, you're probably the same. You probably felt a little bit more empowered, but you were able to go, cool. Now I know what the fuck's going on. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're exactly right, man. And I think what is, you know, since we are talking about, because trauma is so subjective, it can be literally someone, like Siobhan said this, who's my partner, um, you know, she studied trauma and um, she said, you know, it can become someone calling you ugly when you were six. But what it does, the reason why you know it's trauma is because when something like that happens, you know, parents splitting, um, parents walking up the stairs, you know, someone calling you ugly, is that that experience will happen. And then in order to kind of some sort of to, to receive positive affirmation or validation from the outside world, you will start to build up this this certain aspects of you that will receive that and then you will suppress and shame and, and shunt away the, the other stuff that is also you that at the time of that traumatic event wasn't accepted so your psyche kind of fragments and you become you, you start walking even if it's one degree to the left just this slightly less authentic path and i feel like much of the psychotherapeutic process is about reintegrating those moments back into conscious awareness and just be like, hey, look, you know, yes, there are societal norms, you know, you know, obviously you're not going to just go and fucking yell out or do whatever you want right in a, in a church or something. You know, there are yeah. things and guidelines we have to stick to, but it's also about recognizing this was you too, right before this moment, that was you as well. And it's, you know, just because you acted like this and someone said that wasn't good or someone said you ought to do this or you shouldn't do this, it doesn't mean that that's not who you are. That's their shit. Exactly like what you said. You yeah, know? Mm. exactly. And that's, and yeah, and that's what you said. Each trauma has its like, its level mm. and people are going to deal with trauma in different ways. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's just generally, and it's been, the hardest thing is facing it. Yeah. Is that it's the fear? It's Massive. the fear to face it and be able to sit in it and go, like nobody likes sitting in uncomfortable shit. No. Like <laughs> even as a baby, when you like you poop your pants, like, yeah, you scream your ass. Even as a twenty-six year old man, yeah, <laughs> I'm doing it now. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about the cash. <laughs> we'll get to that. Every new job I go to, it's like I'm sorry about it. <laughs> yeah, I keep shitting my pants. <laughs> keep, I'm still unemployed. <laughs> Oh, we had to go there. Tangent. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. But that's the thing is like, yeah, when you start to really dive deeper into that psyche and the the emotional trauma, and yeah, it's it's a big it's a big journey. It doesn't happen overnight. No, and it's, yes. it's definitely, yeah, and it's an unpacking of everything. And you're literally, it's, I, I like to think of it as like, you know, the old school co computers when it was like the IBM computers and stuff. And you had to do a defrag. Yeah. When the computer slowed down so much that it just was shitting itself. And yeah. You were, you couldn't open up that um, porn hub. Yeah. That you were looking at. Unfortunately. It was like, yeah. mom's going to catch me. Yeah. But it was like, all right, I've got to defrag. Yeah. And it's the same sort of thing as like that trauma is like, you've got so much built up on top of this like unstable thing that it's going to take a little time, a little bit of time to reshuffle everything, reshuffle that structure and mm. put it back in and, I think it's also, it's such a, like, as I've started to do some more research and stuff into, like, epigenetics and stuff like that, and, mm. like, when we continue to hold on to trauma or different things, that's when the, the, the cells in that area or wherever in the body, you can start to see breakdown or cancerous issues oh, yeah. and stuff like that start to come. And it's, like, it's so important to actually then really start to work on those areas otherwise yeah who knows what will happen for you definitely and you know one of the first things you have to do with that sort of work is uh kind of allow yourself to be vulnerable and allow yourself to be like i do need some help here because you know r removing that side of things or like okay look i have a problem here that needs to get addressed i think that's one of the hardest things in the world to do you know, and um, yeah, it, it's different for everyone. It takes a long time. It takes decades for people before they can be like, cool, I, I may not have all the answers, you know. But yeah, it's a, you're exactly right, mate. It's it's definitely a, a long process. And I hope, I hope, you know, it would be 
almost embarrassing, you know, that in five years' time now, I can look back on my life now and be like, holy fuck, I was holding on to a lot of shit then. Yeah, yeah. You know, I would hope that that's the case. You touched on vulnerability. It's a bit of a keyword at the moment with the, in the health and wellness industry and just people who are going on that journey of um, self, self unpacking and like growth. What do you actually consider to be vulnerable, especially as men? Like we, we generally don't open up or don't have the words to show mm. our vulnerability. Mm. What would you consider to be vulnerable? Fuck, it's a really good question, man. Um, I think vulnerability is, you know, somewhat congruent with um, humility. It's just kind of like maybe I need some help, and it's not. It doesn't have to be about mental health or whatever it is. Just it's it's about telling the truth yeah. you know and if you're in a situation in life where you're not fucking ecstatic 24 7 like you are literally simultaneously eating 10 mdma pills and coming <laughs> all the time if that's not you then you should probably reach out to others yeah. because and that's no one by the way in case you couldn't guess the sarcasm <laughs> No one no is eating that much MDMA and, and orgasming maybe. that much. <laughs> if they are, I want to meet them. <laughs> How are you doing That's this? That's another podcast. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, but the the idea behind vulnerability is being honest with yourself and then finding the courage to be honest with someone else. And we have evolved um, socially. You know, yes, life is an individual game, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't involve other people. And it has to involve other people not only for the reasons of um, survival, like what it has for millions of years, but also at the same time, you may know something I don't. And if that is the case, and if, that's gonna, if that bit of information is going to help me, I mean, I'm going to be selfish and ask you. And then my, I may know something you don't, you know? And no one has it figured out. But there are other people and many other people in this world that have the areas that you don't have figured out, figured out, or at least are moving towards that journey. Mm. And so vulnerability is a bizarre, it's a bizarre word because people think it's, you know, it's weakness, you know? And I don't think, I think more and more people are coming to terms with the actual significance of the word vulnerability. But it's, it's it, I think for me, it comes down to, to humility and, and truth yeah. with yourself and with others. And I think like growing up in Australia and being an Australian, it's, you kind of, we grew up for years thinking the little Aussie battler yeah. doesn't ask for help. He just yeah. gets it done and however they can get it done is how they get it done. Yeah. But it's slowly starting to change. You go, yeah, okay, like I need help in this. I need help in that. Like, yeah. Otherwise, you just end up going, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. Like, and shutting down. And that's the thing is, yeah, is knowing when to ask help. Mm. And even if it doesn't work for you and you that it doesn't resonate with if you've asked for that help you go oh that doesn't actually really resonate with what I'm doing or go and seek out more like that's what I've been loving lately is just like seeking out the help of others Mm. because it's just like I don't have enough time in the day to do all the shit that I do no and whether it's unpacking the thoughts in my brain someone coming to someone who actually knows how to unpack my thoughts Mm. Or someone who knows how to set up a website or whatever, and yep. say, I don't know how to do that shit. You can do it, mm. like, and then that way, then it just allows you to level up, and it frees the space in your head, in your body, or in your like wherever it is yep. to be able to then just focus on that shit that you're really jamming on doing, yeah. and then possibly having those ten MDMA. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> simultaneous experience. <laughs> but look, like this is a very, very clear analogy that I think is like really pertinent here all right let's say you are day one tradie on the job you've never ever even picked up a fucking hammer before and you need to build a house right where are you going to start yeah you will have no idea you don't even know what the word nail means yeah. like you you I bet someone's telling you you have to build a house or, or you yourself want to build a house yeah can you do anything else but ask for help right if you're depressed and anxious and you're carrying a lot of weight through traumatic experience, you're an addict, right? And you want to get happier or you just want to find yourself a bit more or you want to just not be in that shit situation again, right? If you're that far entrenched in pain, 
you're like that tradey who doesn't know what the word nail means. You have no idea how to build a house. You have no idea how to find happiness and meaning. And you, don't, you have no idea what meaning is even relevant to happiness or whatever it is. You don't even know what you're aiming for. It's the same thing. You've, you've got to ask for help. Yeah. And if you think you have it all figured out, you are going to stay stuck in that situation. And it sucks because pe- a lot of people do. And, you know, we don't get a whole lot of time here. And there's going to be one day when you're going to fall asleep and never wake up for eternity. And the idea of who you are is completely gone and eradicated. No one will know who you are. Gone. So the only thing you have is your own sense of worth. And you should cherish that. Mm, Absolutely. Like, yeah. And you know my story and people who've listened to my podcast, uh, they would know. Mm. And it's the same thing, yeah. You're given a finite amount of time and sometimes people cut that Mm. short and it's just like being able to take that bull by the horns and take that apprentice step into asking the builder how to get out of that hole then that's where you start to really find that if if, yeah the way forward and i guess Mm. that's what you're doing with your work and um, trying to <laughs> and trying to yeah um, failing asking for help many times so you're yes. and, and like you're taking on men women all ages all different types of people or yeah specialising in something in areas and yeah I, th- I think um, I probably will I'm working with a um, with a with a psychologist who he actually is in, he was on my podcast recently he's um, Order of Australia medal and he um, spent 25 years um, studying and working with complex trauma people with PTSD and understanding a lot more a lot more about um, you know dreams the integration of trauma to conscious awareness like looking into that field but um, you know working with people from all different kind of areas in life purely because I want to I want to learn more about people I want to learn more about the mind and I think if I just stayed in one avenue um, I could become hopefully very good in that avenue but it wouldn't give me a broad sense of the human psyche in its mm-hmm. totality and um, I think the areas that I love helping people the most in um, at least at the moment is like I said you know that trauma stuff fascinates me so much but uh, anxiety responses and I guess the existential component as well like how you can start to gear towards finding purpose as opposed to chasing the lovely transient idea of happiness which yeah. is very very funny to me you know that somehow it's important for us to just be happy all the time is so bizarre because it's just like when you're really fucking thirsty happiness is a glass of water you yeah. know it, it, it changes all the time but yeah. you know what what does get human beings out of bed every morning rain hail or shine is the idea that there is a reason for them to do so and then finding that as subjective it is for people um, is, uh, you know, it's Morpheus said it to Neo in The Matrix. He was like, there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. So in order to find purpose and have life unfold as you embrace it, you actually have to take the first step um, because you're not going to have all the answers at our age, mate. You know, yeah. hopefully, again, like I said, we'll look back 60, 70 years from now and be like, Jesus, yeah. what, what the hell? We, I can see what we were doing. But um, yeah, th- those areas I'm just fascinated with and I love talking to people about it Mm. so that brings me to uh, my next question three tips that you would love to offer to the listener that they could take away that you've learnt or you'd like to share with them that they could potentially like nail or start integrating into their life tomorrow to start to build into that next better or best their best self best self is to start first one would be to start telling the truth as hard as that is and you know it's not like people always want to fix all their problems in like one day you know they'll they'll go out and get real cooked and then the next morning they're like I'm never drinking again it's like awesome (laughs) let's see we've all been there we've all been there yeah Yeah. Um, I do it all the time (laughs) I said I'd never make that joke again but I did it (laughs) god (laughs) but like that's great, but how about next weekend you just drink one less beer? Yeah. And then you'll just be proportionally happier and more proud of yourself. Because I think a lot of life is about developing um, really good self-discipline. Um, but tip number one would to be um, be honest, um, or at least more honest than you have been. Because we all lie, you know. Yeah. But as long as you don't lie about the big things in your life, the things that are really holding you back, 
um, that can be a really great first step. Uh, number two, um, off the top of my head, I think this will probably resonate with men more specifically, but definitely with women, is that we have in us these primordial instinctual forces that just want to bubble up all over the time. Like we all are just ravenous, ultra sexually inclined chimps that want to fucking eat and fight each other. You know, like, like I said at the beginning of that, there's probably more uh, tended towards men there. But if you cannot um, try to shame yourself for that, but just express those instinctual emotions in productive ways. Like for me, I found that I, until recently, um, I didn't realize that anger, was, I had a really big issue with anger and um, that would be suppressed and then fueled into resentment. And starting jujitsu, I just feel a lot less angry, almost to the point that I don't have anger in me anymore. Yeah, yeah. You know, I feel really great. So having like that um, outlet of like, powerful whatever it, whatever you need you know anger isn't necessarily prevalent within any within a lot of pe- everyone but um, whatever you need don't be afraid um, to do that as long as it's productive I don't want you to go out fucking stabbing people yeah. you know but you, you need you need to do that it's so healthy for you to do that you know um, so telling the truth or becoming more truthful um, letting out your emotions in productive ways and then the final thing I would say would be to have a think about um, a hobby that you really enjoy. Like, um, you know, passion is a word like vulnerability. You know, it's kind of like a fucking, he's talking about kale juice. You know, <laughs> shut yeah. up. Yeah. You know, yeah. but like something on the side where you have a lot of autonomy in, yeah. where you're not um, totally guided by what, a, what the boss is telling you to do or what you should do. Yeah. Or the Buddhists call it like, you know, that Dharma work. Yeah. Um, but having something where it's totally up to you and it's totally up to you how good you get. Like, it could be knitting for someone. Or like, my, I mean, my boss, who I get along with, um, he's just gotten into um, beehives, you know? But who knows where that could end up? Yeah. So, and how good would it be that to say that this is your thing? You know, for me, it's writing. Yeah, and that's, 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 that's the thing is like, we, especially when you start to really jam on something, and you're really enjoying it, mm. and then it, you, it, it kind of comes into your work, and you're now getting paid for it. Yeah, that's where that you start to get those blurred lines with like, is it now a hobby mm. or is it work? And then I then say, okay, yeah, I'm still getting paid for it. It's something I'm getting paid for. I am accountable to somebody. It's kind of, it's still a hobby. I'm still loving it, but find something you're not actually getting paid for. Yeah. And you just froth it, mm. whether it's surfing, like beehives or yeah. candle making. Yeah. And that's the thing is like that's your thing for now. Like yeah, your 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 bees, your honeys, and yeah. your honey might end up being your you selling and you, but you're just frothing it. Yeah. And yeah, I I, I agree. I love the the hobby situation because it's just it's you doing you with what you purely want to actually be able to do. Definitely. outside of the man or whatever is telling you what to do and yeah it's really like for me it's surfing and rock climbing yeah I'm the happiest when I'm doing those two things it's just like um, yeah I can, couldn't agree more and you touched on writing yeah you're a, you're a bit of a writer enjoy it yes, yes I love it I did it when I was a kid I think hobbies are very much succinct with like what you did as a kid when you were completely unconscious you weren't carrying around any of that I ought to do this I should have done this that fear you know a lot of what we were doing as a kid like you know a lot of us were doing things like the fact that you're getting out there on the surfing board or climbing or all that sort of stuff like how how like congruent is that to childhood we're climbing on trees and yeah. playing playing like it's there's playing. no such thing as time yeah. it is playing and yeah. yeah and I feel like <clears throat> I listened to a podcast the other day I think it was um, Paul Check. Um, and they were talking about how adults struggle to really play with children and not cast their dispersion and, or their idea on how the game should go. Mm. Children are at their most raw and just literally will pick up a stick and that becomes that becomes a person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas yeah. an adult will pick up the stick and go, no, that's a stick. Like, yeah. That's, like, that's a stick, Timmy. Exactly. It's like... No, but he's seeing it as a person. We're allowing him to see it as a person. And it's just like being able to go back as an adult and start to like just be 
in your environment and mm. just allow that to happen and be at play is one of the most fulfilling and just lighthearted experiences I think you can do as an adult especially yeah it, it's it's brilliant like there are uh, specifically in like Mahayana Buddhism what they'll do is they'll take their students and they'll um, give them these like really bizarre riddles and they'll try to you know to test to see whether or not they're enlightened and obviously like full enlightenment like reaching that stage of nirvana which means blowout is essentially the ego is just gone, gone so it's yeah. you just pretty much die you know you're literally just up in, just floating away you're yeah. just gone yeah. yeah yeah um but like one of the things i was reading a book and um um they were talking about how one of the things a uh, a zen master did was he gave like a, a cooling fan to um three of his students and he was like what's this and one of the students went like this and for everyone listening it was like waving the fan he took it back he was like okay cool so he's identified purely with the label that someone told him it was anyway gives it to the next one and he just kind of plays with it again so he's not he's like opening it and closing it so it's not essentially he's not using it for its socially constructed purpose but he's still using the fan he's like no take it back he gives it to the last person the last one takes a chocolate cake and gives it back to him and he's like cool that guy gets it it's basically the idea that like the labels that we put on things to define things, people get so ingrained with exactly like you said, a stick is a stick. It could not be a person. But have a think about who put the labels on those things. Yeah. The ego, the human being, you know? And one of the things that the Bodhisattvas do and the people that the, the Buddhas that have reached enlightenment but stay behind to help everyone that's struggling and suffering is that they try to teach people that labels are socially constructed and really the only meaning that we attach to anything is the meaning that we actually can and we want to you know life is just this big big game and this massive playing field but we define ourselves and we don't have to do that that's getting very off yeah we could but... literally go down a rabbit hole maybe we'll pick that up another day yeah right? yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> we could literally go that was hectic <laughs> two hours later we're like yeah so dude <laughs> like just yeah fuck hobbies <laughs> yeah yeah we're back on the hobbies <laughs> <laughs> oh god, I know. We actually started talking about your writing and Oh yes. So. That's, yeah, <laughs> shit. I know. Well that that's actually part of the second book. The second book um is about kind of that inward journey and starting to find, you know, one the the psychologist I love the most is Carl Jung. I love yeah. his work. It's he's just changed the way I see the world. My dreams have changed ever since I started reading his work on about the unconscious. And, um, you know, that's where I got that idea from. He said, what did you do as a kid that made the time fly like seconds? Therein lies the answer to, to your life's meaning. Yeah. And for me, it was writing. I, I, I wrote a kid. I wrote, when I was 10 years old, I wrote a book about a kid who struggled with depression. Um, and it was, and I knew it was, I was 10 because it was dated 2003. And, um, so I think I've always been interested in, um, philosophy, um, and, and 10 I, year old writing about depression that's pretty interesting yeah I know I think I was struggling with it then you know I said um, the first memory I have is a panic attack because I was um, I looked at myself and I was really worried about how I got into this thing you know that people call the human body um, but um, they were my first memories and I always use writing as a way to kind of understand myself more um, and then you know like we are talking about at the beginning of this trauma comes in ought to do's ought not to do's and I I stopped writing and I started chasing football for the expediency of wanting all the girls and all the money and stuff but then that big trigger because sometimes the unconscious just goes you know what fuck you man I'm still here man exactly deal with it you've deviated yeah I'm gonna let you know about it (laughs) so then it was kind of like trying to find that path again Um, I, I you know a unit of measurement to go off that is the people in my life um I really bond with a lot more. I feel a lot happier being myself. Um, I love talking like this with good people like yourself. Um, so I'm just going to keep trying to chase that that feeling of oneness in myself. But yeah, yeah I do love writing. It's 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 awesome. I think everyone should write. Everyone should have a podcast. Absolutely. Everyone should write. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, I never. I always used to say that I wasn't much of a, a writer, and I started writing, writing poetry. Yeah. And poetry just flows. Yeah. Like, I just. I just think po- and if you can put a, a nice uh, if I can put a nice poet, poem together it just like it talks to me and whoever reads it mm. takes something away from it and yeah like 
I've never been yeah I've never been much of a, a con like a writer like yourself writing books but like one day uh, mate one I, day no but I, like <laughs> that's the thing is like compiling these poems I have over a hundred and something poems now and oh, it's yeah. like it's almost book worthy yeah and it's, I never thought I would actually be able to do that mm. it's just writing poems and just scribbling words down and making them work and it's mm. like Emma my girlfriend she refers to me as like really quite analytical and placing the Jenga blocks of where they need yeah. to go and I feel poetry is kind of that way as well because you're placing the words where they need to go to make it flow yeah very and true yeah I feel like when I'm writing it that's it it's like that 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 the mind is working and putting it in yeah that works that sounds great that keeps rolling it keeps rolling and yeah that's really quite something special about it, being able to write something and I, I agree some people should be out, like who gives a shit if it sounds like crap to, to begin yeah. with like nobody else has to read it yeah Humpty Dumpty sat on the fork <laughs> it doesn't sound right <laughs> that would be a bit painful that'd be yeah. shit <laughs> yeah, yeah poor old Humpty Dumpty's uh, crackers <laughs> Hard these crackers. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll circle it back into the final three questions. Uh, three things that you'd tell your younger self. Fuck, it's a, that's such a good question, isn't it? <laughs> three things that I'd tell my younger self. You know, I think like... I mean, what do you tell your younger self? Because like, I'm just trying to put myself in the mindset of who I was, you know, five, ten years ago. And telling myself five, ten years ago that footy may not be for you would just be like, who the fuck are you? Yeah. Like, footy is everything to me. Yeah, footy everything. is for most adolescent males. It's everything. That's literally what it is. Yeah. yeah. I, I just can't imagine, like... Um, you know, not think... So, I guess on that front then, what I would say, because I don't think you should ever steal a lesson from anyone, you know. I, I think it's something that hopefully in a couple of years' time when Trevon and I start thinking about having little ones is that I would never want to take a lesson from them because it, I would be robbing them of the experience of life, you know. Mm. So, I think what I would do to my younger self would just be, be like, you know, you're loving footy at the moment. You're loving um, doing what you're doing, whatever it is. Just make sure that whatever you do in life, you do it to its fullest capacity. So there's no stone unturned, you know? So that would be one, I guess, really doing things to to the best of your ability. Um, number two, I think, would be to um, just try to get a little bit more reflective. So I guess I could tell my younger self to just have a think about who you're hanging around with, um, like why almost like developing a conversation like learning to develop a conversation or like a self audit almost um, and I guess number three would be it's really like yeah it's a brilliant question man it would be to really cherish the times where you literally can't stop laughing yeah and that's it I reckon that would be really good because they're so important. They're, Absolutely. Yeah, we, we hardly ever get those times. When we do, fuck, they're, they're brilliant. Yeah, and especially like you, in, they're the times that you can sit back and you go, like, whoever was there. Yeah. And especially if you do like a cool guided meditation or whatever and that person drops you into that time where, like, experience that time where it was the most fun in your life. Yeah. And you, it brings up, that's that, bubbles up that, fucking awesome energy that you want to be at and as a kid that's you have so many so many of those experiences yeah um and to be able to yeah i think just to be able to relish though that's yeah, it's a pretty good answer i love that one that's good isn't it yeah. we get we you and i have a lot of those mate yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, a few more that's it. we'll make sure we do yeah, yeah. so um yeah we'll definitely catch up and do let's do another podcast mate for sure um, for sure where can the guys catch you? What what are you doing? Where are you at? What socials are you on socials anymore? You got dropped off them for a bit. I did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah six months I kind of went off them. Um, I just needed to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but uh, yeah, like Mind Mate Counseling is something that I'm most excited about at the moment. It's the, uh, on Instagram, it's Mind Mate Counseling. 
think it's on Facebook as well, but that's where you'll kind of find all my podcast snippets and, um, you know, highlights from my YouTube channel. Um, to, you know, it's kind of like top of funnel stuff, get people aware of the sort of um, counseling that I do and the kind of the way that I um, have a look at the mind and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I would just say that. I would just say that. I want. I don't, I don't have to go and go crazy on it. You can find me when I was ten years old. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's what I'm Everything most excited. Else is there. That's your yeah. one central hub. Yeah, my yeah. mate counselling. It's really exciting for me. So if you are keen for a chat, if any of this has resonated with you, then um, you know, um, don't feel afraid um, to reach out. And if I'm not the right person for you, then um, hopefully I know someone that does, or that is the right person. So yeah. Cool, man. Thank you for coming along. Mate, it's been I loved a great it. chat and uh, some good giggles. Our pants have been off the whole show. Yeah. Um, which has been liberating. Yeah, liberating. Yeah. It's like. Liberating. As liberating. Well. <laughs> it's been liberating. It's taking me back to that 10 year old boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. A little bit too liberating. <laughs> G'day, mate. Get your hand off it, Daryl. Sorry. <laughs> it's not a stick. <laughs> and eggplant. Thanks, mate. No worries, mate. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>